This film tells the story of the Harvest Brigade, a mobile agricultural machinery team created by Massey Harris in 1944, and the story of the world's first successful self-propelled combine harvester, the Massey Harris No. 21. During World War II, the U.S. economy was forced to produce more than ever before, not only military goods, but also food. American farmers had to feed not only their own troops and civilians, but also the civilian population and armies of the Allies. Food supplies to the Allies were truly colossal. For example, meat was shipped to Great Britain. Despite the fact that almost all meat production on these islands during the war was imported, the civilian population received two and a half kilograms of meat per month through rationing. Furthermore, the famous American canned meat, Spam, was sold at retail without restrictions. Spam was also supplied to the Soviet Union in huge quantities under Lend-Lease. Military deliveries of American canned meat to that country totaled 664,000 tons, exceeding the Soviet Union's own production at the time. Soviet veterans recall that from 1943 onwards they ate exclusively American canned meat. But back to America. As the war progressed, farmers were asked to produce much more food. The 1942 grain harvest in the United States and Canada broke all previous records. But the U.S. War Food Administration set a goal of maintaining these volumes, aiming to harvest 1 billion bushels of wheat in 1944. To implement these plans, farmers had to work and overcome additional difficulties. There was a shortage of hired labor as more and more young men were drafted into the military. During the war, 15 million American men and women were drafted into the Army, representing more than 20% of the pre-war workforce. Many of them had previously worked in agriculture, one of the largest employers in the pre-war economy. Furthermore, many farm workers went to work for defense industries, which then offered relatively high wages. Farmers attempted to cope on their own, enlisting the help of their wives and children. The problem was somewhat alleviated by Congress's enactment of a draft deferment for farmers and agricultural workers. But ultimately, it became clear that the acute shortage of agricultural labor could only be resolved by improving the efficiency of agricultural production. It must be said that by the end of 1940, American farmers had already managed to significantly increase their productivity compared to previous years. Several technical factors contributed to this. Farmers began using more sophisticated machinery, new crop varieties and livestock breeds, new pesticides, and improved irrigation methods. Moreover, the state became more active in stimulating farming, both through direct payments and indirect support. But now, under wartime conditions, farmers had to comply with a completely new set of regulations. To purchase a tractor, bring their produce to market, resolve labor issues, or receive support from government programs, they had to deal with military and defense departments, which regulated and rationed everything to primarily support and supply the war effort. Steel, rubber tires, and engines became difficult to obtain for the production of tractors and agricultural machinery, and restrictions were placed on the consumption of fuels and lubricants, among other things. Agricultural machinery factories switched to producing materials for the war and were allocated quotas for their former civilian products. Under the new conditions, civilian agricultural equipment production was to be maintained at 80% of the 1940 level, while companies were required to sharply increase the production of spare parts for the repair and maintenance of old equipment. Since agricultural products were selling well at the time, most farmers had enough money to purchase new equipment, but production quotas made it difficult to acquire it. Farmers often had to convince the government that with new equipment, they could produce more than anyone else. Surprisingly, war production didn't halt the development of agricultural machinery. On the contrary, new challenges gave rise to new technologies. Tractors became smaller but more powerful, equipped with hydraulic systems for attaching implements. 
and became more productive, nor did their numbers on farms decrease. Counting old and new machines, the number of tractors on U.S. farms increased from nearly 1.6 million in 1940 to 2.4 million in 1945, meaning the farm tractor fleet increased by two-thirds during the war. The war also didn't stop various companies from competing for the agricultural machinery market, demonstrating resourcefulness in circumventing various government-imposed restrictions. Ford Ferguson tried to convince the government that its tractors were less metal-intensive and more powerful than those of its competitors. Thus, they argued, Ford should be authorized to produce thousands of these tractors, replacing the old heavy machines, which could then be converted into scrap metal for shipbuilding. But this idea was rejected. But in 1944, Massey Harris approached the War Production Board with a request for materials and resources to produce their new self-propelled combined harvester above the quota. Massey Harris's terms attracted the government's attention, and they received approval for their project, which they called the Harvest Brigade. Massey Harris Limited was a Canadian agricultural machinery manufacturer formed in 1891 through the merger of Daniel Massey's Massey Manufacturing Company and Allenson Harris, Son & Company. Massey Harris became the largest agricultural equipment manufacturer in the British Empire, producing threshing machines and reapers. The company entered the U.S. market with the acquisition of the Johnston Harvester Company in Batavia, New York, in 1910. In 1927, Massey Harris acquired J.I.K.'s Plow Works in Racine, Wisconsin, allowing it to begin producing tractors in the United States. In the 1930s, they became interested in self-propelled combine harvesters. The invention of the combine harvester, a machine capable of combining several separate harvesting operations, reaping, threshing, or winnowing and gathering into a single process, is considered one of the most important inventions in agriculture, significantly reducing labor costs, accelerating the harvesting process, reducing crop losses, and in other words, increasing the efficiency of grain production. The first combine harvester is believed to have appeared in Scotland in 1826. It was a large horse-drawn machine designed by Patrick Bell. However, Bell did not patent his invention. 1834, near the village of Climax, Michigan, Hiram Moore and John Haskell built and put into practical use the first successful grain combined harvester thresher which was patented June 28, 1836. The machine had a cut width of 15 feet, was capable of reaping, threshing, and winnowing cereal grain. This combined harvester was pulled by 20 horses, and its working parts were driven by a ground wheel. After tractors replaced horses in farm fields, tractor-drawn combines began to be produced. These machines had cutting widths ranging from 8 to 20 feet. The required tractor power when working with a trailed combined harvester depended not only on the size of the harvester, but also on soil conditions and terrain. On average, a 16-foot combined harvester required 30 drawbar horsepower from the tractor. The combine itself was equipped with a 20 to 25 horsepower engine. The combine harvester was operated by one or two people, in addition to the tractor driver. The combine's productivity depended on the cutting width of its header. At a forward speed of approximately 4 feet per second, this equates to approximately 2 and a half acres per foot of cutting width in a 10-hour workday. Due to the heavy weight of the combined harvester and tractor and the use of two engines, fuel consumption per acre of harvest was high. Some models used a power takeoff shaft, but this required a tractor with a more powerful engine. Furthermore, the large dimensions of the tandem limited its maneuverability. Farmers and engineers around the world sought to optimize the harvesting process with combined harvesters by improving their designs, including making them self-propelled. Benjamin Holt of California received a patent for the original self-propelled combine in 1908, but production didn't begin until 1916. It was a 12-ton machine with an 18-foot header. Except for the transmission and gasoline engine, this model was all wood. Holt's self-propelled combines were produced from 1917 to 1921, with a total run of just 308 units. In 1923, 
The Sunshine Auto Header Self-Propelled Combine Harvester was patented in Australia. That same year, the Baldwin brothers patented a self-propelled combine in Kansas. There were some other developments, but the overall level of technological advancement at the time rendered all efforts to create a self-propelled combine unsuccessful. The machines were too heavy, cumbersome, and expensive to manufacture, and over the short seasonal period, they did not justify the large initial outlay. By the late 1930s, practical combine harvesters remained tractor-drawn trail types. Massey Harris recognized the need for self-propelled combines in 1936. Company engineers Tom Carroll, Robert Ashton, and Albert Luke created the world's first affordable, mass-produced self-propelled combine, the number 20. It was tested in Argentina in 1937, but proved too heavy and expensive for large-scale mass production. With the introduction of the Massey Harris No. 20, the word combine came into common usage as a designation for this type of grain harvesting machine. The No. 20 served as a design model for the lighter and cheaper No. 21, which was tested in 1940 and went on sale in 1941. A modified model, designated the 21A, was released in 1943. So what was this first successful self-propelled combine harvester that no one could make for so long? The number 21 was a self-propelled cart on four pneumatic wheels on which a reaper and thresher were mounted. Compared to solid steel tires, pneumatic tires significantly reduced traction resistance and increased the forward speed of the machine during operation, reduced stress on the mechanisms from jolts and made transporting the machine on roads more convenient and safe. In the field, the combine moved at four speeds, from one and five-eighths to four miles per hour, and on the road, from three to seven miles per hour. Reverse gear was also available. The combine was powered by a Chrysler Model T112 L-head, six-cylinder gasoline engine with a displacement of 217.7 cubic inches, producing approximately 55 horsepower. The number 21A modification was equipped with a 218.6 cubic inch engine, producing a maximum torque of 166 pound force foot at 1,600 revolutions per minute. The engine was started by an electric motor. The combine's technological scheme included a header with auger table. The number 21 model had a canvas table, a rasp bar threshing drum, a four straw walker, a double sieve cleaning unit, and 45 bushels grain tank. Raspbar cylinder replaced the peg tooth type used in tractor-drawn combines. This type of drum provided better performance, crushed the grain less, and was more easily adapted to harvesting various crops. In a raspbar drum, grain was forced out of the ears passing between the raspbar and the concave. While in the peg tooth drum, the ears were threshed by the impact of tooth. Auger conveyors replaced quickly wearing canvas conveyors, and straw walkers replaced conveyor rotor and other types of separators. The self-propelled combine harvested grain as follows. The reel bars tilted the crop toward the cutting unit and threw the cut stalks onto the header conveyor. Two screw augers fed the stalks to an inclined feed conveyor, which, together with the receiving impeller, sent them to the threshing unit. There, the grain was threshed, drawn between the rasps of the threshing drum and the concave. Most of the grain, along with small impurities, fell through the concave's grated surface into the grain pan, while the remaining grain, along with the straw, was sent to the straw walker. In the straw walker, the remaining grain was separated from the straw and, along with the chaff, was sent to the sieve cleaning unit. Unwinnowed grain from under the threshing concave was also sent there. On the sieves, under the force of an air stream from the aspiration fan, the grain was cleaned of impurities and passed into the grain auger. It was then sent to the grain tank by a scraper elevator and a small auger. Any grain that did not separate on the cleaning sieves, along with impurities, was sent for re-threshing or re-separation. After passing through the straw walker, 
The straw was thrown out onto the ground. Initial experience with the number 21 demonstrated that it was an excellent harvesting machine. It was more productive and economical than tractor-drawn combines, and it required only one person to operate it. Massey Harris realized they had created a revolutionary machine that would be in great demand and could sell in huge quantities. But due to government restrictions on civilian production during wartime, these prospects were virtually non-existent. Then Joe Tucker, Massey Harris's sales manager, took up the task. Realizing that under current conditions food was the country's weapon, he saw an opportunity to develop a plan to build new combines that would suit both the company and the government's plans to increase food production. Massey Harris approached the War Production Board with a request for materials and resources to build 500 new number 21 combines, on the condition that the company would sell these machines only to farmers who agreed to harvest at least 2,000 acres of grain per season. To meet these conditions, a single combine would have to harvest the fields of not just one, but many farmers per season, moving from farm to farm across the country, from south to north, as the crop ripened. Moreover, the farmers would not work alone but in teams, with the company providing technical support. Massey Harris claimed their technology would save half a million bushels of wheat per season, which older machines would have left in the fields. Furthermore, the self-propelled combines would free up 600 to 1,000 tractors for other work and save half a million gallons of fuel. Importantly, due to the combine's efficiency, this plan would also save labor. Massey Harris named this mobile team of agricultural machinery the Harvest Brigade. The government accepted the idea, 500 number 21 combines were built, and in 1944, 500 farmers were selected to purchase them for $2,500 each. They signed contracts to harvest at least 2,000 acres using the purchased machine. With the start of the harvesting season, the Harvest Brigade combines set out to work in California, Washington, the Great Plains, and Texas. From there, the combines traveled north following the ripening grain. For longer distances, they were transported by truck. Massey Harris understood that their venture had received widespread publicity and was under close scrutiny from farmers, the government, and competitors. Therefore, they strongly supported the project, which if successful, promised enormous commercial benefits for the company in the future and an increase in their market share. Massey Harris even used aircraft to check the ripeness of the crop and monitor the availability of combines in the area. Fuel and consumable supplies, repair crews, and trucks were organized. The Harvest Brigade was a huge success. Local farmers earned enough money to afford the combine services. The standard rate was $3 per harvested acre or 25 cents per bushel. This was profitable for them. For several months, from May to November, the combines followed the crop all the way to the Canadian border. During this season, each harvest brigade combine harvested an average of 2,038 acres. The remaining promises made by Massey Harris to the government were also fulfilled. The following year, 1945, Massey Harris and the War Production Board expanded the Harvest Brigade program to include 750 new combines. By the end of the war, Massey Harris dominated the self-propelled combine market. Other companies tried to catch up, but Massey Harris was far ahead. For example, John Deere didn't release its first self-propelled combine, the Model 55, until 1947. In April 1982, the American Society of Agricultural Engineers designated the Massey Harris No. 20 combine as a historic agricultural engineering landmark citing the machine as having opened a new era in agricultural mechanization and revolutionized the grain harvesting process.